right. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. You are with the Gregory and Vine team for our Vine Plus Happy Hour. You're going to see some more people popping in um, just periodically, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I hope you all have your cocktail with you. Um, my name's Emma, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Amanda, and she's going to introduce our special guest for this evening. So tonight we are tonight, it basically is five, six. Um, <laughs> Uh, we have uh, Ryan Maybe. Um, he is co-founder of uh, Jay Rieger & Co., but he also has a background that extends way past that. Um, Ryan started um, with the Booming Craft Spirits and started Manifesto in Kansas City and the Rieger. Um, Ryan, what year did you get into cocktails? Like really, well, what's that? Like really starting your getting into the craft movement. Um, it really started about fourteen or so years ago. I opened a bar called JP Wine Bar, and uh, we were a wine focused bar, obviously. But I had a fully scratch bar where we used uh, fresh juices and made everything from scratch. And so I started to really get into it at that point. Um, but uh, it was a few years that it took to uh, kind of honed that part of it and then manifesto i opened in 2009 and you can tell us a little bit can you tell us a little bit about um getting started with the rieger brand how you found out about it and kept growing with that because i know that there's a great story to share with everybody that goes with that yeah i could take a whole hour uh <laughs> talking about just that that story alone it's it's really interesting but um, basically, the short version of it is I opened Manifesto in 2009, so that was uh, 11 years ago. We actually just turned 11 years old uh, last month, and Manifesto is in the basement of this really beautiful old building that was built in 1915, and it was called the Rieger Hotel. Um, it was no longer a functioning hotel when I opened Manifesto, but uh, the name was carved into the stone at the top of the building, and there was an R logo tile floor on the, on the first floor. Um, and that was the extent of what I knew about it. But about a year after I opened Manifesto, I had the opportunity to take over the first floor and uh, I wanted to do a restaurant. And so I wanted to know more about the history of the building and see if I could work that into the, the concept of the restaurant. So I started researching the building and I discovered that uh, it had originally been the Rieger Hotel, but it was owned by a gentleman named Alexander Rieger, whose father, Jacob Rieger, actually had a whiskey distillery here in Kansas City. Uh, dating all the way back to 1887. And so that was part of the Jay Rieger and company uh, business. And what was really so fascinating about that was that I had no idea there was ever a whiskey brand in Kansas City uh, way back then. I didn't know that there was, uh, that it even existed. And so then I became just obsessed with finding out as much as I could about the history of the brand, um, worked that into the concept of the restaurant, called the restaurant the Rieger. And then when we opened the Rieger on December 20th, 2010, um, I met Andy Rieger, the great, great, great grandson of Jacob. He came in on opening night. He was actually living in Dallas, but he'd heard about what we were doing and came up for the grand opening and, and introduced himself. And I was just like, wow, this is, uh, this is amazing. We should partner and resurrect your family's whiskey company. And uh, that, was, uh, that was 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago when we met. Um, and now here we are. And you guys opened the distillery in 2014, started looking to resurrect the brand, but officially opened in 2014 in Kansas City. And then things just kept growing. And last year, just a year ago, opened the brand new Spirits and Destination in Kansas City of J. Rieger & Co. Distillery that contains the monogram, the Hey Hey Club, a 40-foot slide that you can take from the, first, or from the second floor down to the first floor, Whole distillery process that you see when you come in um, and there's more to come. Yeah so we, we resurrected the brand in 2014 um, by uh, coming out with our Rieger's Kansas City Whiskey. This was our, our first product um, and we actually were we were renting a warehouse that's just next door to us here um, but we grew a lot bigger a lot faster than we thought and in 2017 we purchased this building which is about 65,000 square feet 
And, you know, the, in, initially our business was we were just making booths and we were really uh, focused on distribution and uh, just getting the product out on store shelves and other bars. Um, we didn't have a tasting room or tours or, or a bar or anything like that. Uh, so that's when we, we built this and opened this last year. Uh, so we went from just a small production facility to a 65,000 square foot facility where we uh, have daily tours. We have three bars, including this one that I'm in right now, the Hey Hey Club, um, multiple event spaces, the slide, uh, as you mentioned. Um, so it's, it's really been a, it's been a lot of fun. It's been wild. Um, that part of the business just opened last July and then we were just kind of getting it all figured out when uh, we had to shut it down. And can you tell a little bit um, to everybody about what's kind of going on while you guys are shut down? What are you doing for uh, COVID practices uh, with some of the hand sanitizer, your cocktail kits, and even what you've done for your employees? Yeah, so to be honest, it was really, really, really rough. And uh, it, it was uh, devastating initially. We really were, we were probably just moments away from uh, deciding to lay off everybody. When we went, when we opened this, facility last July, we expanded our company, which was just like 12 or so people. Um, that was production, uh, sales and marketing and administrative, just like a, a dozen people. We expanded to almost 90 people uh, full time because we added bartenders and servers and daily tour guides and retail workers and kitchen staff. And, and uh, the, the business just took on a whole new life. And so when we had to shut down that part of it, we really were afraid we were going to have to lay everybody off, and uh, it was it was quite a you know a difficult situation. But um, we kind of uh, just took a leap of faith and decided to go into the hand sanitizer business to see how it would work out for us. Um, and honestly, at the time, I didn't think that it was going to be a real big uh, thing for us, but the the demand was absolutely overwhelming. Um, and we launched that about seven or so weeks ago, like March eighteenth, probably March nineteenth. And uh, now today we have done over, we've produced and distributed over 100,000 gallons of hand oh sanitizer. Gosh. And we have uh, managed to retain all of our employees. Uh, everyone is still on board full time. Um, we have shifted our, our bartenders and servers and, and all front of house people to hand sanitizer production. Um, so they've all got you know, full time uh, paychecks as well as uh, health insurance. Um, and all that, and we're still making booze, and we're still uh, we're still trying to to make sure that we're we're selling booze. But you know, most of our business was in bars and restaurants, and we're distributed in 23 states. But most of our business is in bars and restaurants, and so that that part of the business just fell apart immediately. Um, and while we're trying to do everything we can there right now, it's the hand sanitizer that's really uh, getting us by at the moment. Yeah, that's well, really awesome. Well, Very amongst, admirable. Amongst all of that fantastic news. You guys also received um, some great news about the Hey Hey Club that's right there that you're standing in. You guys received a top 10 honoree from Tales of the Cocktail. Um, can you tell us what that means for you? Uh, yeah, it was, it was really nice. I think we got that notification you know, right after the shutdown, maybe two weeks after the shutdown happened. So it was a little bit of a uh, you know, ray of sunshine in the middle of all the, all the chaos. But you know, this bar is really beautiful. I mean, it's uh, very much inspired by my original bar manifesto. So it's small and dark and cozy and um, comfortable uh, with really high end uh, bespoke cocktails, you know, um, but there's just a ton of passion and energy and creativity that went into it. We didn't really spare uh, any expense at all. So our uh, beverage director, Andrew Olson, um, uh, spearheaded the, the cocktail menu, which uh, is right here. And it's really, really wonderful. Um, the name itself actually is a, uh, a resurrection of an old Kansas City jazz nightclub that was really famous during the 1930s and 1940s. The Hey Hey Club was the home of Count Basie. Uh, you've probably heard of Count Basie, the big band leader. Um, it's a real famous place. Um, so we decided to bring that back and, and pay tribute to Kansas City history that way. So getting the nod for uh, best new American cocktail bar uh, from Tells of the Cocktail was, was pretty special and definitely got us more, even more energized to, to get open as quickly as we can, or whenever, whenever we're ready. What, what are the, what are the next steps for Jay Rieger? I know that this time period right now is, is crazy and rough, but where are you seeing the 2020 maybe going now? Well, so when we were, when this happened, we were actually in the middle of 
designing and getting ready to start construction on our outdoor patio. So even with all the, the construction that we did last year, we held off on the final phase, which is a very large outdoor uh, garden bar. And so that immediately uh, kind of went into uh, uh, flux and we weren't sure, but the, the sanitizer business has been uh, good enough to uh, allow us to move forward with that. So that's a, another way that we're able to keep the staff uh, excited about everything and optimistic about everything because we're moving forward with uh, building that and anticipating that we'll be able to open uh, later this fall. So, you know, we're, we're still, we're trying to be positive. We're trying to be optimistic. We don't know exactly what things are going to look like. Uh, we're not, we're also not going to rush the reopening. So we're going to wait um, once the, the city and the state decide to lift the, the stay at home orders and, and let businesses open. Uh, we're not going to rush to open right away. We're going to wait and see what happens and make sure that we're taking all the necessary precautions and doing everything uh, the right way so that we're taking care of uh, our employees and our guests. Uh, why don't we switch in, uh, a little bit and talk, talk about the, the cocktail of the evening, the horse feather. Um, Ryan, can you share us a little bit about what this cocktail is and how to prepare it at home, especially? Yeah, so the horse feather is a, it's more or less a modern classic uh, that's uh, known as coming from the Kansas City area. It was actually um, invented in Lawrence, Kansas in the early 1990s, probably 1991 at a restaurant called uh, Paradise Grill and then made popular at a bar that's still around today uh, called the 8th Street Tap Room. Uh, so if you go to Kansas City and, and you can go just about anywhere and you're gonna see uh, either a horse feather on the menu or uh, on a chalkboard behind the bar, or if you ask the bartender, they're gonna know how to make it. It's, it's a real simple drink. It's a really uh, classic, regional, uh, well-known cocktail. Um, it's just uh, originally it would have been rye whiskey back in the early, early 90s. So it would have been Old Overholt rye with ginger beer and then a really nice heavy batch of uh, Ang Angostura bitters, or not one batch, but multiple, um, and a squeeze of lemon. So it's light and refreshing. It's really easy to make, so uh, you can get it at just about any bar, uh, regardless what type of bar it is, and you can also make it at home. It's super easy. Uh, but it's, uh, it's very approachable, and it's definitely our, our best-selling cocktail. Mm -hmm. We actually uh, have it on tap. Uh, we go through so much of it. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, that's, and that's one thing about you guys. So they have uh, on tap cocktails uh, that run throughout the um, Hey Hey and the Monogram Lounge. And like you said, Horse Feather is one of them that they can run up, just have quick cocktail service for people. Yeah, the, the draft cocktail thing is, is something I've been uh, uh, dabbling with for the last four or five years. I had one uh, cocktail on draft at the Rieger and I had installed some at some other bars that I consulted for. Uh, but with this uh, project, we were really allowed to take it to the next level and do something really, really aggressive with it. So we built a, uh, a dedicated walk-in cooler uh, that's 500 square feet for all of the kegs. Um, and we ran 24 draft lines throughout the entire building to all of our bars, um, all run on glycol. Um, and everything, uh, every line, every draft line that we use we can switch the gas at the point of entry from CO2 to N2O, which means that if we're pouring a drink like the horse feather or like a mojito or something like that, that's fizzy and carbonated, and then we wanna switch that to a, a, a more of a stirred booze forward type drink, like say a Negroni, you'd wanna to go to nitrogen instead of carbon dioxide. And so you can switch the gas right there at that point of connection, uh, which is really, uh, it's fantastic for being able to uh, uh, switch things out on a regular basis and not be limited in, in our in our options. Um, but it's really that's been that's become our, our primary area of focus, especially for the monogram lounge and our tasting room bar. Uh, so that that would be on the first and second floor. Uh, those are bigger uh, bars, you know, designed for large groups and social gatherings. So being able to pour cocktails on draft really fast uh, really makes it easier for us to. to provide good cocktails with really quick service. Down here, it's a little bit more intended to be uh, a la minute and everything prepared to order. Mm -hmm. I have so a Ryan, random we, question. We, what, <laughs> oh, what's sorry. the no, oh, it, it was about the, ho the horse feather. I, I don't know what kind of ice you recommend, but I was using kind of smaller cubes of ice and they've totally melted. Do you think it's better to use like a bigger hunk of ice? Is that how you prepare it at the at the Hey Hey Club? Um, we usually don't use a giant cube on the horse feather just because it's a kind of an old school um, highball, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean, we use Hoshizaki cubes, which are the one by one cubes, so they're not like little pebbles, but you know, I've had a horse feather before that 
uh, we served over crushed ice. You know, as long as it's packed tightly in the glass, it's actually going to work really, really well. It just sort of depends on the, the liquid to ice ratio, honestly. Mm -hmm. So Ryan, we've all been, most of us have all been home on probably going about two months now. Um, what are your cocktails to, to have at home? What are your top cocktails that you recommend? Um, definitely, uh, horse feather. Obviously, that's a given. I think Negroni is one of my favorites uh, to make at home. Uh, it's quick and easy, uh, good and boozy. I also think uh, there's nothing quite like having a pre-batched and diluted bottle of really good martini in your freezer and ready to go, uh, super cold. Um, so that's always nice to have. I actually, uh, just the other day, batched out about 150 of them and put them in individual little four ounce uh, bottles and shipped them around the country to uh, friends just to have a martini. Um, so that's always nice to have. Um, but yeah, I mean, you got time. I mean, you could get creative, <laughs> you know. Wait, so Ryan, can you expand on that? So you're just basically pre-mixing a martini, putting it into yeah. a, a, a single pour and um, then sticking it in the freezer so it's ready to go. Well, so I made some that are individual, like single pours, and then I shipped them around to individuals. But what I would say for home is to not use a little bottle, but use like a regular, you know, 750 ml yeah. bottle and just batch it out as a martini. Uh, you can pre-dilute it 20, 25% water. Um, and put it in your freezer, and then when you when you want, you don't need to you don't need to mix it or stir it or anything like that. You just pour it over a big cube or straight up, and it's good to go. So before we start talking about about your gin, and we definitely need to talk about Rieger gin, um, can we can you just uh, remind us what puts the KC in the KC whiskey category? Um, so I'm not sure everybody is aware, but Ryan, you created a category of whiskey. Um, not just, you know, uh, not just, you're not just the founder of a distillery, but you create a whole new category and it's based on your um, research and your master's thesis at Bar. So I think it's a great story. Can you kind of summarize that and tell us a little bit about the KC whiskey since it's one of the ingredients here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, uh, it was an accident, to be honest. Uh, we didn't go into this with the intention of like, oh, we have to create a whole new whiskey category. That was never our intent. But um, we were definitely trying to adhere to the history and the authenticity of the Jay Rieger and company brand. I mean, having the opportunity to resurrect a brand like that, that was actually huge back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and then failed because of prohibition, having the opportunity to resurrect that brand, we really wanted to do it justice. And so I wanted to know as much as possible about what we were making back then. And unfortunately, there just are no records. You know, there were no, uh, at that time, there were no government regulations around whiskey production. You could do whatever you wanted. Um, there were no permits or licenses issued, so there's no documentation really about what we were making. But um, I dug in quite a bit into just the history of American whiskey production. And prior to Prohibition, I mean, really all we know of is bourbon, which is a specific style, and it, even it wasn't um, regulated in any way. And then also rye. We know that rye was really, really popular. Aside from that, there was a whole bunch of other things happening that that we don't really know a whole lot about. But what I discovered was that one of the most common things that was going on back then was American whiskey producers were adding sherry to American whiskey. And I don't mean putting it in a cask, but I mean literally blending in small minute amounts of sherry into American whiskey. Um, it was so common that uh, sherry producers from Spain were actually advertising uh, to American whiskey producers to buy their sherry in bulk for uh, that exact purpose. I also discovered that we were importing sherry at the time. And so with this being kind of an unknown style of whiskey that was really popular back then, um, and nobody, nobody knows ab about it now, I thought that was an opportunity to do something that was unique and proprietary and would help us set, a, set ourselves apart. Um, so it was quite a long journey to, to develop the actual recipe, but with the help of Dave Pickerel, who was one of our first uh, partners and consultants on the project, and he helped me out a lot. And then also Steve Olson, who, uh, some of you may have heard of, he's uh, kind of a legendary uh, figure in the industry as well. Um, he's a sherry expert. Um, I actually went with him to Spain to source, source our sherry. Um, Dave helped me source the whiskeys. And then we ended up coming up with this blend here that is three different whiskeys. So it's a five-year-old straight rye, a seven-year-old straight bourbon, and then a 10 to 11-year-old light corn whiskey. Um, we take those three, we blend them together, and then we add just 2% of that 15-year-old Oloroso sherry. Blend that all together, 
and there we go. Now, when we sent off that recipe to the TTB for approval, they were a little bit dumbfounded by it. In fact, what they first said was, you can't do this. And we were like, well, why can't we do this? They said, you can't add cherry to American whiskey and still call it cherry. But it turns out that it's actually in their own legal guidelines. There's a chapter on this in the TTB Beverage Alcohol Manual that was written in 1934 that specifically says you're allowed to blend in cherry up to two and a half percent and still call it American whiskey. But this has been so long forgotten that they didn't even know it existed. So we had to point out their own law to them and say, well, here you go. And they were kind of uh, baffled and said, well, okay, I guess you can do this, but we don't have a category for it. We don't know what to call it. And so I asked them at that point, if since we're resurrecting this brand, since we're doing a style of American whiskey that hasn't been done since prior to Prohibition, uh, could we uh, call it Kansas City whiskey as a style? And they said yes. So it was kind of a, um, an accidental um, resurrection of an old category, but also creating a new one. It, it allowed us to tribute to our history, but also be innovative by, by today's standards. Wow. So is it the addition of sherry that makes it Casey, a Casey whiskey style or also the, the rest of the whiskey blend? It is a blend of straight whiskeys with the addition of sherry. So okay. what that does is it actually allows us to get creative within the category. Um, and that's what we wanted. We want to be able to elaborate on the category. And we also don't necessarily want to be the only ones doing it. So if other producers would like to mimic this style, I think it adds more credibility to the category itself. Um, I think that would be great. But it is, it's a lot of extra work. It's a lot harder than just, you know, sourcing a bourbon and putting that in a bottle or, or doing what everyone else is doing. Uh, there's a lot more work that goes into uh, coming up with a blend like that. And then finding, getting the sherry was really, really hard. Like, talking with the sherry producers in, in Hereth and getting them to understand what we were doing and then partner with us. But we really lucked out. We have a great partner in Williams and Humbert. Uh, the sherry is beautiful. Um, it's, we now buy all of it from them. Uh, every bit that they make and ship to the U.S., we take it all. Um, it's, really, it's really been something else. But yeah, it allows us, like if we wanted to say, you know, use a malt whiskey or a wheat whiskey and instead of using Oloroso sherry, use Amontillado sherry or or Palo Cortado or whatever, we could do any of those things and would still fit within, uh, within that uh, category. Well, Ryan, um, before we get into making a cocktail, which I'm sure we'd love to watch you do, um, can you tell us a little bit about your gin? Um, your gin has a great story. It's Brieger's Midwestern Dry Gin um, and great partners and collaborations for this. Yeah, so the gin, um, the gin we actually uh, brought on the former master distiller of Tanqueray, uh, Tom Nickel. Tom Nickel was with Tanqueray for, for 42 years. Uh, he created Tanqueray Number no. 10, which is the most awarded gin in history. And he's kind of, he's a legend. He's widely considered to be the most accomplished gin distiller uh, alive today. Um, it just so happens that he ha he's really good friends with Steve Olson. Um, who I mentioned earlier, who's also a good friend of mine, and Steve is a partner in our company. And back in 2014, when we started all this up, Steve said, you know, if you ever want to make a gin, uh, we should get Tom Nickel. And I'm just like, yeah, right. I mean, we're not Diageo, you know what I mean? But uh, one year later, Tom announced that he was going to uh, retire from Tanqueray at the age of 59, but Steve knew that he still wanted to do some things on his own, just not under the Tanqueray uh, brand. And so we thought, what the hell, let's give it a shot. We called him, he lives in Scotland, um, but he was willing to come to Kansas City. And so we flew him to Kansas City and he spent a week here with us. And I think that he had quite a bit of culture shock. Um, I think, you know, he, he fell in love with Kansas City barbecue and Boulevard Take 7 beer and our dogs. And the next thing we know, uh, we're partners. And Tom is now a partner in the whole company and has uh, developed the recipe for our gin for us and has been overseeing the distillation and mentoring our head distiller, Nathan Perry. And can you tell a little bit about the uh, Day with the Masters that you guys have done? You've had your Master Series, uh, first series of Master Series gin come out this last year. Yeah, so one thing that we take a lot of pride in um, that you may have noticed is, is mentorship and collaboration. We really like working with other like-minded individuals. Um, we like, you know, to work with experts in their field and people that know what they're talking about, like Dave Pickerel and Steve Olson and Tom. And so um, having a bartender background and taking a lot of 
pride in, in uh, mentorship and, and that kind of thing. I wanted to share that with other bartenders. And so we came up with the concept for a bartending competition where the prize is not necessarily just monetary, but um, the, the grand prize would be to create your own gin and get to distill your own gin, which would become a legitimate product under our label uh, with Tom Nickel. And so we kicked that off last year and uh, the first winner was uh, Michael Guinacore, uh, who uh, worked at Death & Co in Denver. And he came here to Kansas City last July and we distilled uh, the first Master Series gin. He got to formulate the recipe with uh, Nathan and with Tom Nickel and they made it and we just bottled it and just started to sell it um, March 1st I think was, uh, was when we officially released it and uh, so we're, we're, we still got it we're gonna wait until uh, we get reopened to try and get it out there a little bit more but it's a really great program that I I mean if I were still a, a you know a full-time bartender I would jump all over an opportunity like that it's it's really cool well, we'd love to see you make um, some cocktails. Um, what would be your first one you'd like to start with? Well, I can show you the horse feather. It's not real exciting to like see because it's so easy, but I'll go ahead and just knock it out real quick. Just in and, case you're wondering. Perfect. And for you all, we'll, um, I have a nice little uh, PDF to share with you all that has um, some of the cocktails that Ryan is making so that you guys will be able to okay, have this that is, there. This one's just a highball, so really easy. One and a half ounces of whiskey. Um, if you spill a little bit extra in there, don't worry about it. You'll be all right. Um, ginger beer. If you're purchasing a ginger beer, I think Cock and Bowl is probably the best um, easily found option. It's, a, it's available almost everywhere, and it's actually really good quality. But I have discovered uh, through traveling quite a bit that uh, there are some really good locally made ginger beers available in every other market as well, which is kind of fun to experiment with. So it's just our whiskey, ginger beer. I'm going to top it off with just a little bit more. And then the real key here, you might say, well, this is just a Kentucky Mule or a, a Kentucky Buck or, or a whiskey ginger, whatever. Um, the real differentiating factor here, not just uh, our whiskey being unique, um, but the Angostura bitters. If you order a horse feather in Kansas City, what you're going to get is this, you know, whiskey ginger highball, but with a significant amount of Ango right on top. And then the garnish is just a, a small squeeze of lemon, just to brighten it up a little bit. And that's it. So you'll even see that there's a, a clear delineation between the Angostura and the rest of the drink. You can see that when you first present it. And you also smell it. It's the first thing you smell right in the nose, which is re what really makes it unique. And then, of course, you can just stir it all in. And uh, this drink won't last long. Uh, you, you'll pound it quickly. I feel bad. <laughs> I'm, the only, I'm the only one drinking. Yep. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Should I do another? Yeah, definitely. All right. So this one's kind of fun. Um, I've been doing a, a weekly video series called Netflix and Cheers, where we uh, we started this uh, online Netflix watch party every week where we pick a movie and then we pair a cocktail with the movie. And we've had bartenders and people from all over the country tuning in. It's got a little chat room on it. It's really, really neat. Uh, a few weeks ago, I did uh, the movie Inglorious Bastards, and I paired it with a riff on the Suffering Bastard. And the Suffering Bastard is a really cool old classic cocktail that was invented in 1942 in Cairo uh, during World War II. It was a hangover cure initially uh, for British officers that were stationed there during the war, and uh, that's how the name uh, became Suffering Bastard. So there have been riffs on it over the years, like the Dying Bastard, and it got like modified for tiki drinks and all that kind of thing. Um, but what I decided to do was just mix it up a little bit and call this one the Quarantine Bastard. Um, I thought it sounded better and a little bit more creative than the Quarantini, um, which I, I'm tired of hearing about. So, um, it's actually uh, it's an ounce of whiskey and an ounce of gin. This is actually, that is part of the original recipe of the Suffering Bastard, believe it or not. Um, and then what I decided to do was velvet falernum. You might have heard of this. 
It's a classic liqueur from Barbados. Um, there's four primary ingredients, clove, ginger, almond, and lime. Um, so it's kind of tropical, kind of bright and spicy and zesty, um, but with some nice sweetness to it as well. So I'm gonna do about three quarters of an ounce of that. And then three quarters of an ounce of fresh squeezed lime, lemon juice, sorry. And then a few more dashes of tango for good measure. Brian, are there any substitutes for velvet falernum? Are there any what? Are there any substitutes that you could sub in for the velvet falernum if I wanted you know, to make something similar at home? You know, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have even been able to find that. Um, it was all but extinct. Uh, fortunately, now it is back. It's brought in by the House Alpens Import Company. Um, it's really, really good stuff, and it's very traditional down on the island of Barbados. And now you're starting to see some other knockoffs of it. So there are some other Falernums out there. Uh, this is the original brand, it's called John D. Taylor's. But you can get some, uh, some newer brands that are made by some smaller local distilleries. So fortunately, you don't really have to hunt for anything else. But you can get creative, like maybe a ginger liqueur or maybe a little bit of a allspice dram from St. Elizabeth, something like that. Something spicy and sweet would be the way to go. Mm -hmm. Then we're gonna shake it up, strain it over ice. And this one gets topped with Topo Chico. Make it a little fizzy, nice and refreshing. And there you go, quarantine bastard. <laughs> Helen says to maybe uh, Quentin Tarantini. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that one. I'm usually, <laughs> the one. I'm usually the one coming up with the really bad puns. Right, right. I just, I love that movie. I'm after, I'm going to go watch it after this, after we're done here and make it great. Amanda, please promise to send that recipe. That looks awesome. Yeah, um, I just sent you all, you can copy that link and download and then I'll also make sure to forward it all to everyone in an email afterwards. Oh, cool. So what was the connection to Egypt? The original, you said the history started in Cairo? Yeah, so the, the bartender, um, I don't remember the bartender's name, but he worked at a hotel, a real fancy hotel in Cairo uh, called the Shepherd's Hotel, and it was a, a destination point for uh, the British officers. So it was mostly the British Army that was stationed there. And so those officers were mostly hanging out uh, at the Shepherd's Hotel, and uh, they liked to drink, and uh, they liked their gin, and so, bartender came up with that drink as a, what was back then intended as a hangover cure and called it the suffering bastard. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great looking drink. I can't wait to make it. Yeah. We're trying to make it. And it's funny, velvet falernum is a weird ingredient. It's such a great ingredient. So I had I love it. Yeah, we were all going back and forth about it a couple of days ago when you said you were thinking about using it. So yeah, just a great reminder. Um, well, the other thing is, if you are familiar with velvet falernum, you know, there aren't a whole lot of uses for it. Classic cocktails don't call for it very often. Probably the most famous drink is called a corn and oil, and how many people have heard of that? It's also yeah. not very good. Um, so it's not something that you see a lot out there, but you're starting to see it resurge a little bit with the whole, you know, the cocktail renaissance and all that. So bar new bartenders are starting to work with it and come up with different uses for it. But I just really like it and thought it would work really well uh, in that particular drink. Cool. Um. I'm not sure if you're going to make another cocktail, but uh, you know, I was just uh, I was doing some research on Amari, and I keep coming across the Cafe Amaro. I don't know if yeah. people really use straight into that too. Yeah, but, we can uh, definitely talk about that for sure. Um, just got a kind of a unique story to it as well. So Cafe Amaro. Uh, we have four core products. We've got vodka, gin, the Kansas City whiskey, and the Cafe Amaro. The Cafe Amaro is kind of, uh, it has a different origin story to it. We didn't go out and like get, you know, the, the master distiller from Fernet and say, help us make an Amaro. Um, this actually was a 
uh, an ingredient that I came up with myself about eight years ago uh, at my bar manifesto. I perfect, I personally love coffee and I love Amaro and I like drinking them together and I don't have a real sweet tooth. So um, I was, I was always frustrated with the fact that if I wanted to use a coffee flavor in a cocktail, it was like Kahlua or Tia Maria or something that was really sweet and not, uh, you no, know, not bitter or acidic. And, you know, coffee is naturally a bitter acidic beverage, not a naturally sweet beverage. And so I wanted to sort of play with that idea. And so what I started to do was make a coffee liqueur uh, with a cold brew uh, toddy and add Amaro botanicals to it. So we were steeping the coffee grounds with gentian root, vanilla bean, bitter orange peel, cardamom, star anise, mint, juniper berry, uh, on and on, and making our own homemade liqueur that uh, initially was going into cocktails, but then it kind of became the, the, the house shot um, and the, kind of the bartender's handshake shot at the bar. And it was just really, really popular. Everyone loved it. So when we launched this company and then we're starting to spitball different random ideas about products we're going to do, I'm like, this, we've got to make this a legit product because there's nothing like it on the market. Um, and I think that bartenders would really gravitate to it. So we figured out how to ramp up the production um, and make it on a larger scale and make it more consistent. Uh, we partnered with a local roaster here in Kansas City called Dalmeas. So they are awesome to work with. Um, we sourced really good botanicals from uh, Europe and we're making a, what is truly an Amaro um, by macerating all the herbs and botanicals in neutral spirit, right, over time, uh, which is like 110 proof. But then instead of, when we go to bottling proof it, uh, instead of cutting it with water, we cut it with cold brew. So we lower the proof with cold brew coffee, uh, which obviously adds co coffee flavor. And then we take that mixture and we put it in spent whiskey barrels from our, our Kansas City whiskey and let it age for about four to six weeks just to let those flavors uh, harmonize and, and come together. And then there you go. So what we end up with is a uh, really fresh, bright tasting uh, coffee liqueur that isn't sweet, but it, it drinks more like an Amaro. It's got that nice herbal bitter finish. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. So I think you had one more cocktail to share. I think it was the ultimate martini or the perfect martini. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Let me grab a glass real quick. I love making martinis. Um, it's really uh, an art form and something that I, I really dig. So um, I like to get a little bit creative with them. I don't like to, to, to veer too far from the original martini. I typically will go for a two to one. So two parts gin, one part dry vermouth, a couple of uh, dashes of uh, orange bitters. But I sometimes like to tinker with that one part vermouth section. And I'll take that one ounce of vermouth and I'll split it with both dry and blanc vermouth, or uh, dry vermouth, blanc vermouth, and a little bit of fino sherry to add some uh, savoriness and, and, and saltiness. It's just fantastic. So uh, with this one, I think I, I decided to just do the, the perfect martini, which is equal parts uh, Dolan blanc and Dolan dry. So we're gonna go with a half ounce of each of those. I put it up here. I haven't bartended in a while. And then two ounces of our gin. And you also want to get a little bit of orange bitters in there. So here's one reason I like making this drink so much. Um, you know, the rule is if, if you've got citrus and sugar um, in a drink, you shake it, right? And you wanna uh, aerate it and you wanna emulsify those ingredients. Um, but one thing you gotta remember is when you shake a cocktail, um, it doesn't just get it cold or, and diluted, but it also adds air bubbles. It forces air into the drink and makes it temporarily fizzy. Right, which is why when you shake a margarita or a daiquiri, it's gonna have a nice little foam head on it. You don't want that on a, on a martini. So um, 
James Bond was wrong, you don't shake a martini. <laughs> uh, you typically stir it. If it's all booze, you stir it because you want it to get nice and cold, um, but you want to have that silky, clean texture where you can get all the botanicals from the gin and all that flavor, right? So you don't want to over dilute it. You don't want to bruise it. You don't want to aerate it any, but there's a step between the two. So if you're using a larger amount of vermouth, if you're using say one ounce vermouth or more, if you're doing like a 50-50 martini, in that case, you want to open it up a little bit. And so you use a technique called throwing. It's not shaking, but it's also not stirring necessarily. Um, what it is, you take your uh, small cocktail tin, you put the ice in there, strainer, and with your dominant hand, hold it straight out from your shoulder. Not too high, not too low, but like straight out from your shoulder. And don't move this at all. Just hold it in the same place and transfer the contents from this one into this one and then back and forth. So and you're gonna do this about seven or eight times. And I strongly encourage you to do this at home and make a mess. <laughs> I would make a mess I, it, for sure. It, it, would be, it would be everywhere in my house. <laughs> but, so what's happening here is you're introducing just a little bit of air, right? But you're not forcing air into it like if you were shaking. And what this does, it helps get it nice and cold and it opens up the vermouth just a little bit. So it's gonna have a nice full flavor. Like I said, you do this about seven or eight times You'll know when it's done because the tin shaker will kind of freeze to your hand. Oop, lots of little bit. How long did it take you to get good at, at um, doing that? <laughs> well, let's just say you should practice with water. <laughs> What's the technique called again? Sorry? What's the technique? Throwing. Throwing. Like, okay. And then for garnish, I'm gonna use just a little bit of lemon zest. So you get the lemon oil right over the top, run it around the rim. I've already determined that I'm gonna to have to figure out how to do this with tongs for uh, when this is all over. That's a new one. Um, and there you go. So you got a martini, it's got a really nice bright lemony aroma to it and uh, it's lovely. But you can, like I said, you can batch this in you know a large bottle put it in your freezer good to go now ryan i noticed you use um and your suggestion is a coupe glass but um what is your what is your suggestion of a coupe glass versus a martini glass well, let, me, let me show you this is actually a more traditional coupe it's like a little bit of a bigger coupe um, but it, it still doesn't have that like big B thing. I hate the big B glasses because they tend to be really messy. First off, they're too big um, and it forces you to, to make drinks that are too big. Um, but they spill a lot easier. So these are going to hold uh, the contents a little bit better. This is actually not a, known as a coupe. This is known as a Nick and Nora, um, which is a glass that was uh, named after a TV series in the 1950s and 60s called The Thin Man, which is about a husband and wife uh, private investigator team that... Uh, uh, Basically, they just spent most of every episode getting wasted um, on martinis. So it's called the Nick and Nora glass. And I think this is actually the ideal glass for a really good martini. All right. So we have a couple more minutes left. I'm just going to unmute everybody. And if you have any questions for Ryan, go ahead and throw them out there. Um, and then we can close up our happy hour. Let's see, did I unmute you guys? Yes, there you did. There we go. <laughs> All right, any questions guys at home cocktail artists? Well, I have one question because I know I see Matthew and Prairie are on this call and I'm curious, the horse feathers kind of are Casey. Hi guys, by the way, I love, see, I love seeing you guys. Um, and Javi Madrid, you're staying up late, which is really awesome. So um, I'm curious, is there, so horse feathers kind of a Casey Lawrence, cocktail is there an LA cocktail or a Chicago cocktail that kind of that we may not have heard of before 
There isn't really an LA one. I mean, Moscow Mule gets attributed to LA because it was, you know, it's first sort of marketed here and um, the, the sort of drink mythology is that it came from, from LA and an LA bar, but there isn't really, there's not, you know, not in the same way that, you know, New Orleans has the Sazerac and the Vocare and Manhattan and yeah, but there isn't, uh, I didn't actually know the horse feather. I had, I tried a horse feather for the first time in San Francisco mm -hmm. and I didn't realize it was a, a Kansas City cocktail. Well, yeah. Now. Greater heat. Can I ask where you had it? Prairie, where'd you have the horse feather in San Francisco? I, yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, and I'm not, I'm not positive. I don't remember. It was, um, it was down the street from Que Fico, if you know San Francisco at all. I, I don't, <laughs> but I remember I had dinner there and then I went down to a, a cocktail bar at the, down the street. So, yeah. All right, Matt, Chicago. Yeah, you know, you blew my mind with that. I, I've never thought of that. Um, I can't think of any there's nothing cocktail that, that's attributed to Chicago. I mean, there's, you know, all sorts of institutions and, and traditions. A lot of bad behavior attributed to Chicago, but maybe no. Oh, yeah, you know, we were. <laughs> Malort. Yeah, I was going to say oh, Malort. Malort. Um, well, there's a, there's um, a great article out about Malort right now. <laughs> I, I have written two about Malort. Uh, actually, Chicago is still in Chicago. Uh, does some things with Malort um, that make it a little less, a little less Malorty, <laughs> a little more sophisticated. Um, that's I don't want to be known for that. It, that's a cool thing if you're in Chicago. Uh, that's more of a rite of passage. Um, yeah. yeah, I can't think of anything. Uh, um, you know, mostly it's mostly about traditions and and just a drinking culture. But no, yeah, I, I never thought about that. But no, I, not that I know of. So I can I'll, I'll chime in on that a little bit. I mean. Um, you're right about LA, the Moscow Mule is absolutely attributed to uh, Hollywood in particular. And I can't remember the name of the bar, but it was, the drink was actually created by a gentleman named John Martin, who was a marketing guy. Uh, he worked for Hubeline. And uh, he was hired by Smirnoff to promote vodka in the United States. And prior to that, prior to the 1950s, I mean, nobody really had ever heard of vodka. And it was his job to make Americans know what vodka was. And he, he did very, very well. Um, the Moscow Mule was one of them that he uh, created and then marketed heavily at that bar in Hollywood. Um, as for Chicago, um, Chicago is uh, ironically, you know, one of the best drinking cities in the world, one of my favorite cities, but it is absolutely known for not having a reference to any classic cocktails, though some people attribute the old fashioned uh, to Chicago, but falsely. Um, the old the old fashioned really goes back to the 1820s and uh, not necessarily in Chicago, but there was some level of uh, uh, exposure that I got there. And I can't remember exactly where. Um, also, in the 1830 Savoy Cocktail Book, there is a Chicago cocktail uh, published in the book. Uh, that's what it's called, but it's not good. And so <laughs> I, don't, I think that's probably hey. why it never became became classic or famous. Not good doesn't sound like a great endorsement. <laughs> <No. laughs> There are a lot of bad cocktails in that book. It's a great book, but there are a lot of bad drinks in there. Uh, I think we're mostly known for our old hotels that had, you know, speakeasies that turned into bars. Um, yeah. A lot of them. So it, it's more about a culture, but you're right. Nothing I can think of that sticks. Not that I know. You would know more than I would, certainly. Okay, guys, we are coming to the end of our happy hour. Thank you so much for joining us. Ryan, thank you for showing us these amazing cocktails and sharing a little bit about Jay Rieger. If you have a cocktail in hand, I have a little bit left. Let's do a little cheers and then go ahead and sign off. Hopefully we can see you guys in person sometime soon. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Ryan. Good night. Thank everyone. you. Thank cheers. you.